Hi folks, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for clicking on the video as always. I am out in the forest for an overnight there. And it's actually the first of the year. The sun is shining at the moment. There's been some uh, pretty nasty showers rolling in. They're supposed to get less and less throughout the day. But I'm not going to hang around here too long. I'm going to get the, the shelter set up in a minute just so I've got some cover for the next shower. It's the end of March just now and it's actually the, the long bank holiday weekend for Easter. I'm just going to camp out the one night though. It's a Saturday night camp out. Sunday night I'm hoping to stay over this way in the van and then I'm going to hike into a different location for some uh, forest thoughts type stuff but I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So where are we at the moment? Well I've walked into a small ancient Caledonian pinewood remnant referred to as Baton Du and this is one of many kind of small remnants that are sort of scattered through this through this area in terms of pine woods this area is known as the sort of Invereshi and Inshriach group so at the moment I've got sort of Glen Feshi to the south and east of me and to the north we eventually connect into Rothy Mercus Forest. Tonight's supposed to go down to about zero or one I think. Uh, there may be a dusting of snow in the morning, uh, who knows, but we'll see. But yeah, I'm going to get set up just now and uh, I'll bring you back in a while. This is the new under quilt from One Wind. It's actually the first time I've uh, put it on. I think it looks okay. There's so many adjustments though. There's three drawstrings on the on each end, and there's another two drawstrings between them to kind of pull it in that way. So you can sort of pull it in that way and pull it in that way. And then there's additional carabiners all the way along, which I'm guessing you could pull them right up and connect to the the ridge line, but it doesn't really work with this one because uh, it's inside the net. I suppose if you weren't using the net, you could do it. We'll see how it goes. It looks good. I like the color. Always prefer like uh, green or olive to like bright colors. So. It's quite wide, which I like. That's one thing with the uh, like the DD under blanket and even the ticket to uh, ticket to the moon uh, under blanket that came with this, the ticket to the moon hammock. It's uh, quite narrow, and it's okay for me. But if I'm sharing with the dog, which I normally do, one of us tends to kind of end up outside it. So yeah, I think this has got lots of width, so we should be able to, you know, really just wrap it round.
the rain's kind of eased off again. I got pretty heavy there for about 45 minutes, so I didn't go and uh, get any firewood yet. There is a, a little block of uh, non-native spruce, quite dense, that I walked in past and there was loads of like dry uh, standing dead wood in there so I'm gonna go get some firewood from there I think Yeah, so you can see there the wood's nice and dry, that'll burn nicely. Yeah, just making some coffee and uh, drying out a little bit by the fire. The rain stopped for now. It is supposed to brighten up through the evening, so hopefully that was the worst of it. it actually feels really good to be out. It's felt like so long. I mean, you're talking almost five months, I guess. But yeah, even though I haven't been out much, I... I still feel like I've been quite busy. I mean, the first quarter of this year has just absolutely flown by. Really busy at work with the, the storm damage and cleaning that up. And uh, this area here was the, the other area that was hit really bad. Um, over in Fort Augustus, I think it's about 120 hectares that have been approved for, for felling as part of the you know tidy up. Whereas over here, Especially like Lower Glen Feshi, I think it's about 500 hectares in total. So, yeah, it's a big area, especially for this area because it's quite sheltered normally. Uh, you know, 500 hectares is a lot. Yeah, I had a couple of weekends in the van, They're like different weekends. Um, one of them was actually here, and I walked in to have a look at this spot, and there was a little bit of snow on the ground still, but. Uh, I did think about camping, but it was that kind of really like wet, heavy snow and we were absolutely soaked just walking in here, you know. So I only had the hammock with me and I just didn't fancy <laughs> sleeping in the hammock all night with Derek being absolutely soaked. Had the week to Norway, obviously. If you watched any of those videos, thank you very much. That was a really good trip. Um, Felt like I didn't really do much on it, but that was kind of the idea, just a, <laughs> a relaxed, uh, sort of snowy, just break from the norm. Oh, that's good. I'm trying to think what else happened, there's definitely more stuff. Uh, oh, I was over in Applecross again for a weekend, doing the, the annual firewood cutting, and uh, I was trialling out a, uh, like a wildlife camera. And left it out overnight and got some really good videos of uh, the local badgers. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think I got a bit lucky and got a really good spot where they were uh, walking past and I got some really close up video which was, yeah, it was really nice to see. Oh, Dara had his birthday. He's officially 10 years old, which I just can't believe it in some way. I've I've had him. I actually got him a little bit earlier than I should have. I didn't realise at the time, but he's basically been with me since he was seven weeks old. So yeah, it's a long time. His his birthday was back in February, so actually we're coming up to the ten year anniversary of when I actually 
collected them as well. But he seems to be doing okay for now. Um, I've been I've been very lucky with him. He's been pretty fit and strong up until this point, and I hope that continues for a while yet. But I know you never know at this age, but just keep making the most of it, you know, while he's still capable. Oh, <laughs> I uh, I officially uh, reached 10 years at um, the forestry, being employed with the forestry. Uh, forestry and Land Scotland, formerly Forestry Commission Scotland. So that was back in January. So, yeah, 10 years of watching public forestry go down the toilet. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't say that. I might get in trouble for saying that, but uh, never mind. I'll edit that bit out. The, uh, the temperature dropped there and the sky just went really dark. And another really heavy shower that then turned to uh, hailstones for about 10 minutes as well. So it's feeling pretty chilly and damp now. But I've still got um, three sections of firewood to bring over to the camp. So I'll probably do that now and just start processing it. Just to try and uh, warm myself up. It's actually a really beautiful evening now, just like the forecast predicted, it's really cleared up. The sun's just about to go down, but it's really clear, you can feel the temperature dropping now. It's just a shame that we we got quite damp before it did, but it should dry out quite a bit by the fire. Just giving Derek his food, I'm just thinking about making mine too. And you'll be really surprised to know that for my first camp out this year, I've got a steak. Right guys, this is my dinner for tonight, steak, and then I just had some mixed vegetables and uh, noodles to uh, go with it, just keeping it really simple, but this should be good and filling. I've got some Lafroig as well to wash it down, so I'm going to get stuck into this and I will bring you back in a little bit. Had a really nice evening just sitting by the fire, sipping on some whiskey, uh, had a hot chocolate as well. Um, but yeah, ready for bed now. <laughs> you in? Yeah. Go. <laughs> You're okay. You're okay. Good boy.
Alright folks, beautiful morning here, the sun's just coming over the hill over there, I might send the drone up, it's uh, half past seven at the moment, fully light. Careful, come on in, careful. <laughs> Breakfast was delicious. I've just been hanging about the fire and sitting in the sun for the last couple hours. Uh, I packed up just a little bit, still got the tarp up, just trying to dry it off a little bit before I pack it away. Um, but I think I'll go for a bit of a walk around this woodland now. Didn't really get a chance yesterday because I, I got in late and then the weather was a bit miserable. So it's really nice now. So we'll take a wander around and uh, see if we can see anything. So on the way in I actually uh, spooked a, a male capercaillie who was sitting up in these crisscross tree stems here. I was over over that way. I was maybe about 50 meters away and it flew off like through the, through the wood over that way. So I just came back to this point just to see if I could find any like feathers or anything. And just under the tree here, some capercaillie droppings. Quite big ones actually. So obviously this is a, one of the strongholds for capercaillie in Scotland. Uh, so it's nice to, when you see signs that they're about. But yeah, it was just, just up there and that sort of clump of pine branches. Following one of the old uh, forestry machine access routes here, and there's quite a few through this uh, forest block. It's kind of what I wanted to talk about a little bit awesome here too. Um, it's most likely this was a machine come in to thin out the pine wood, uh, probably to well not only improve the, the crop by giving it more space to, to grow but it'll benefit capercaillie as well because they prefer a more open uh, pine wood. To the right here where the pine is more dense it's most likely plantations probably been planted that way there's not so much light hitting the ground floor so it tends to be dominated by mosses and heather but out in the open here, so this is like a, a clearing or a ride between two parts of the, the crop and there's obviously a lot more sunlight coming in here and this area is dominated by by blaeberry which is a, a light demanding species so you can really see the difference either side. So not just where I am right now, but in this area as a whole, you know, in Shriek and Inveresh, there's a real mix of uh, quite dense timber plantation, you know, native Scots and non-native, you know, there's still blocks of uh, spruce and larch throughout the forest and then you've got uh, older plantation that's maybe been thinned out and it's more open and the structures start to change and then as I mentioned earlier you've got ancient pine wood remnants mixed in too so it's it's definitely not a you know it's not an untouched forest 
there's been quite a long history of forest management here. There's been a presence of forest in this area and you know the space side area for a very long time too. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, in some ways it would be nice to have, you know, ancient pine wood over this whole area, but it's not realistic anymore and you can still have a very beneficial forest to wildlife and people with a with a mix, you know, it doesn't all have to be strictly untouched native forest. So here's one of the more open areas. This is one of the Caledonian pine remnants. You can see the trees are a lot bigger, more open grown, a lot more branches, a lot more structure to them as well. A quite dense plantation in the background there. And then the more natural kind of open pine wood here. Yeah, I just found this lovely big pine to lean against. Unfortunately, it looks like it's blown down quite recently, probably in the, the storm over the winter. The, uh, the needles are still very green. I know this area and Glen Feshi, Rothy Marcus, Glen Moore, you know, Speyside, it's obviously got some of the best remaining examples of ancient Caledonian pine forest. And even before humans started messing about with you know, forests in the land too much, you know, say, I don't know, 5,000 years ago, this area probably would have been naturally one of the most heavily wooded areas in Scotland, especially in terms of pine forests, just because of the climate and, you know, where it is. But at the same time, this area actually has some of the earliest records of more uh, formal forest management, I guess. You know, the forest in this area has always been an important resource. The local people used to use it. They would, you know, cut firewood. They would graze their animals in here. It was just, you know, it wasn't the sort of special thing that we regard it as now. It was just their forest to use. And, you know, later on, with access to the, the Spey River, a lot of timber was felled in these areas and they transported it down the river you know, uh, over to the Murray coast and then it was easy to ship it all around the country or wherever it was needed. And in some ways it was probably the commercial aspect and the money in these woods that actually saved a lot of it because some of the lairds over the years, although they might not have protected the, the ancient woodland itself, they still realise the importance of a continuing presence of woodland and there's evidence of livestock being fenced out of certain areas on certain estates, areas were thinned, natural regeneration was encouraged, um, there was quite a bit of planting at different times, some lairds even brought in non-native species quite early on and planted them because they recognised that you know, a diversity of timber is not always a bad thing. Obviously, they didn't realise uh, the, the impacts that non-natives can have on natives and all that kind of thing. But I think their intentions were relatively positive. You know, they were trying to maintain this resource. But that's why we've kind of ended up with a, a real mix of more recent plantation, you know, older plantation, sometimes up to 200 years old. It's been thin since and they've got some quite big trees in it. Um, ancient Caledonian pinewood remnants, you know, it's, it's it's all sort of mixed in together. And even even some of these pinewood remnants, um, some of them might have been left just because they had poor form and they were no good for timber. They may be either too big or too twisted. And they were simply left, you know, not in terms of protection, but they were probably seen as rubbish um, or it could have just been left as a 
a, p a potential seed source. Again, I guess my point is that as much as we would love to see a lot more of the ancient sort of pine wood um, restored, it's not always a negative thing to have a mixed woodland as well. If this pinewood remnant here was surrounded by non-native spruce, that's going to be an issue because that spruce is going to overshadow it, probably seed into it, and eventually these pine will disappear. But with a kind of mixed sort of age group of native Scots pine plantation, you've got a timber resource there, it can be thinned, you've still got like continuous forest habitat. Um, you know, Capper Cayley has no problem using well thinned um, Scots pine plantations. So, you know, you can still have a mix of things that work for wildlife and people still. And I think that's what we need to focus on more going forward across a wider area. Not just having areas that are either commercial use or rewilding and we don't touch them. It needs to be a mixed system. You know, nature doesn't see boundaries and straight lines. But things like scale and sort of connectedness, they are really important and they, they do really make a difference. But for a lot of people, we're not going to get them invested in that unless they're going to get something out of it too. So there has to be some kind of commercial element or wood product element to the forest to get people to invest in it. And that's, that's just the way it is. But anyway, believe it or not, this isn't Forest Thoughts. <laughs> it's just a, a bonus ramble. But I'm going to walk back to the, the camp now. I'm not too far away. I can get packed up and walk out of here, I think. If you want to stick around for Forest Thoughts, please do. I'm going to walk into a different spot to look at probably the best example in Scotland of existing natural tree line woodland. If that interests you, please stick around and if not, I will hopefully see you on the next one. Hi folks, thanks as always for sticking around for Forest Thoughts. I kind of wanted to do this bit in amongst what I want to talk about, but I've actually come back down a hundred or so metres into this uh, sort of mature pine wood just because of the wind noise and it was starting to rain as well. But this also actually helps to illustrate the, the point I wanted to make because I'm sitting at just over 500 meters in elevation here and we have a fully uh, mature pine wood with some pretty large trees amongst it as well. And it's growing here no problem. And you might be able to see on the other side, it's a similar thing and even higher than 500 meters as well, up to maybe six, 600, 650 meters. Where exactly are we? Well. We're sitting on the side of a hill called Creek Foolish and behind us in the bottom of the glen is basically Inshreich Forest, Rothy Marcus Forest is just kind of round the corner over that way and we're actually on the opposite side of um, the glen from where we camped on Saturday night, this is now Monday. But what I wanted to talk about is a habitat that is essentially almost non-existent in Scotland and that is natural tree line woodland. So what is natural tree line woodland? Well it's basically a ecotone habitat which is essentially a, a transition, a transitional habitat and it's transitioning from the high forests at lower elevations up the hill to the proper sort of natural open heathland and grasslands at the, the top of the hill and the sort of alpine communities. Now if you watched the last video in my 
Norway miniseries, you would have heard me talk about the impacts of latitude and altitude on the natural growth of forest habitats. And as you get higher in elevation, soils get thinner, there are less nutrients available, there's more exposure to wind and weather in general, and just the overall growing conditions get harder for the tree, which means they grow more slowly and smaller the further you move up the hill and up in elevation. Now the term tree line is actually a bit confusing because that makes you think of a, a straight line that the trees grow up to and there's nothing above that. And that's essentially what we do have in Scotland. But in a natural situation, like I said, it's a, it's a gradual transition. So the trees get smaller, more open, as slight changes in species composition and the vegetation, and eventually it connects into those proper, you know, high altitude alpine habitats. But in Scotland, the natural tree line tends to be somewhere between kind of 450 and 650 meters, where, you know, forests like this can still grow. Beyond that, you know, growth really starts to be impacted and the trees get smaller and you know you can see a, a definite change starting to happen. Now in Scotland unfortunately there is actually a tree line and it usually sits about 400, 450 meters and the reason for that is if you're growing trees commercially beyond 400, 450 meters they're not going to grow that well. It's also probably going to be quite hard to access that timber as well. So in the past, a lot of forest has been uh, fenced off at that point. So you have your forest, you get up to 400, 450 meters. It's fenced off, usually uh, some kind of deer fence. And beyond that, historically, the land has been burned, and drained for grouse moors, for upland sheep grazing and of course there's, there's large sporting estates that have unnaturally high populations of deer as well. If you're a tree trying to make a living beyond that fence you basically don't stand a chance against you know fire or uh, very high grazing pressure and that's essentially why we've got no woodland at higher elevations in Scotland. So again, in a natural situation, especially somewhere like here, you would get the pine wood dominating to about 600, 650 meters, you know, decent sized trees. But beyond that, you're kind of getting into the proper kind of montane or mountain woodland. And although the pine can still persist, in places that are similar to Scotland, like Norway, you'll see that birch, and more specifically mountain birch, which is actually a subspecies of downy birch, starts to become the dominant species. So you'll still have juniper, uh, dwarf birch, uh, willows, some of the montane willows start to come in, but that kind of twisted high elevation birch is by far the, the dominant tree. And of course, that's just completely missing here. Um, I think it's something like, so like 50 to 100 sort of mature mountain birch trees left in the whole of Scotland or something ridiculous like that. So essentially that mountain woodland habitat in Scotland is functionally extinct. It's so scarce, it's so fragmented, there's so few mature trees to act as a seed source it's it's practically non-existent that mountain woodland should be present from kind of 600 meters you know right up to to 900 meters no problem you know, you'll see that all over the place in in norway and i'm going to keep mentioning that because norway is the closest example of what it should be like here you know you'll get trees right up to to 900 meters yeah they'll be small and stunted and you know twisted and gnarled but they're still there and 900 meters is almost Monroe height now if you're not from Scotland or familiar with Scotland 
the Monroes are basically the highest uh, mountains in Scotland. Uh, above, I think it's is it 913 or 14 metres, essentially 3,000 feet. Anything 3,000 feet and above is classed as a Munro, and they're our highest mountain. So you're talking about woodland right up to almost the top of these hills. And if you know Scotland, that's, you know, we're not even close to that. Like, nowhere is that the case. But what should you actually see in a sort of fully natural situation from low elevation to, to the hilltop? If you're here, there's going to be pine forest in the bottom of the glens. You could have areas that are more dominated by broad leaves like oak, depending on you know where you are in the country. Here, obviously, Scots pine dominates and the forest would also include uh, downy and silver birch. You're gonna have rowan, you're gonna have aspen, and you're gonna have juniper as a, a like an understory scrub species as well. You would also get alder and willows in riparian areas, wet areas along watercourses. As you move up through the elevation, those species stay largely the same up to, as we were talking about, you know, 450 to 600 meters. As you start to hit kind of 600, 650 meters, the pine is still present. You can still get pine regen up to 900 meters, but it really starts to struggle and it really starts to get sparse and thin out. And that's when the mountain birch would take over and you would tend to see uh, a kind of shorted, more stunted woodland, twisted birch. You're still going to have juniper, you're going to have dwarf birch, the willows, um, sort of mountain willow, woolly willow, downy willow, all the salic species, up to around 900 meters, and then you would get into the, the, the proper sort of open alpine heath and, you know, very thin skeletal soils, just where it's very open and harsh, but like naturally. Because we're almost completely missing this huge area of habitat. I mean, if you think from kind of 450 meters up to say 800 meters to be sort of conservative about it, across all of our uplands should be mountain woodland and sort of montane scrub and these kind of things. That's a huge, massive area of habitat, natural habitat that's missing. And obviously the, the wildlife and the ground flora and everything else that goes with the woodland habitat is missing too. So in the past when I've said, you know, that the uplands of Scotland are just dead and unproductive, that's exactly what I mean. And it really is difficult, even for me, to comprehend the scale of what we're actually missing in Scotland. It's, it's, almost, it's almost unbelievable. Part of the reason there's such a good example remaining here is because some of the management that's taken place in the past year, and I kind of hinted at that um, earlier on in the video uh, when I was talking about the, the pine woods I was in, and essentially the, the laird of Rothy Mercus back in the, the mid 1800s was a man called William Patrick Grant and he was fairly proactive in forestry management on the estate and he actually carried out quite a lot of work to promote natural regeneration and protect the forest resource. And this actually included uh, keeping livestock out of the forest and off these hills behind Rothy Marcus and Inchrieck. So he was quite keen in keeping the livestock, you know, sheep and cattle, uh, down in the bottom of the glen in the agricultural land and leaving the forest alone to do what it does. That management alone is why here, and especially more Creek uh, Feichlich, around the corner at Rothy Marcus, are the best, if not close to the only remaining sort of natural tree line woodland at any sort of scale. 
because in a natural situation although these trees are adapted and they can persist in these harsh conditions some of these trees would have still been heavily browsed by deer and, and suppressed but they were able to come back when you know the grazing pressure was taken off so the deer has obviously managed at scale in this area and we can see that it's working we're starting to get pine regen but in areas where the habitat was completely removed and it hasn't been there for a long time you know burn graze whatever it's very hard for that habitat to come back naturally without say our intervention because the seed source just isn't there the grazing pressure is probably still high and it's just it's just not going to happen chances are that land or that the ground is now dominated by uh, sort of rank grasses and thick heather too and it's just almost impossible for seed to penetrate and trees to come back up through it and that's partly why even in this area especially uh, this glen here we're starting to see a lot of pine coming back because there's still a lot of pine here to provide a seed source but we're seeing very little else there's some juniper and there's an odd tree but the birch is almost completely gone it's you know it's a lot softer than pine in that respect it would have been grazed burned away and now there's no sort of considerable seed source especially at high elevation to provide that seed to to bring it back the closest example of how it should look in scotland is southwest norway and i was actually lucky to travel there in the summer of 2022 to see for myself and to be honest it was it was almost like a gut punch to be honest because just seeing for myself the scale of just how much we are missing in this country it was almost overwhelming to be honest and even though we're managing areas now to try and bring some of these things back it's going to be 100, 200 years before we see anything like some of the areas over there. We went on a hike into the mountains and we were above 1,000 metres I think, so above Monroe Height in Scotland and we were walking through birch woodland and even in the more open exposed areas there was there was a carpet of uh, dwarf birch too, you know it was it was small but it was still there. I could really talk about this for hours and the video's getting quite long already but I'm going to throw a load of uh, links to videos and articles in the video description and I really would encourage you to, to go and take a look. One of them is a link to my own uh, Norway video uh, which is also on YouTube. Uh, it's a bit long and drawn out I wasn't the best at editing. I keep thinking about redoing it just to make it a bit more watchable. But anyway, the the core uh, the core message that I'm trying to get across is still there. So if you watch, if you fancy watching that, then please do. I'll also put a link to uh, a video from Mossy Earth. It was done in conjunction with uh, Gus Routledge from uh, Reforest in Scotland. He's doing a lot of work at the moment on. Uh, the mountain birch in terms of recording and uh, kind of promoting uh, the missing habitat and you know doing work into like potential seed source and growing on trees for you know restoration so that's a good video to watch too and I'll also put links to a few articles basically comparing uh, southwest Norway and Scotland I think some of you will find it really interesting if you're not aware of it already but yeah, I'm gonna gonna leave it there for now. I appreciate you watching as always. If there's any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And hopefully I will see you on the next one.